Okay, so there are a couple of things. Uh, number one, please make sure you come into this site, training.imotechtraining.com, and then register. First of all, so let me log out to show you guys again because some people are having uh, problems doing this. So let me log out. So if you come to training, you come to this site, this is the portal. And all you need to do is, if you can come up, uh, so you come here and uh, you're gonna see here, the first thing you need to do is register, right? Or you can just click on the class the, the IT fundamentals and uh, it say create an account, right? And once you create an account, it will send you an email. But if you don't get the email, I will confirm it, we'll confirm it on our end. And uh, once you create an account, just come back and log in with your username. Oops, if I can. So you come back in and then you should see uh, the class here, the one you're, I'm seeing all the classes because I have admin, but you will see the class, you click on this one and then you can, you can just enroll for that class. And then once you come in, this is what you're gonna see, okay? It will give you the dates. So today is gonna be day two, seven to nine, and the next one will be Thursday. So these are the dates for the class, right? And here is what you have to look at. Uh, as we move along, this tab is gonna get open, right? Mm -hmm. So right now we have three, so this is new. This is what we're gonna cover today. Uh, this was the stuff you're supposed to get before class starts. Most of the, the how to install Zoom, you know? And uh, here, I forgot to tell you guys, um, I'm gonna go through this a bit because um, I did the intro and then we jumped to cybersecurity. But today we're gonna start uh, uh, computer fundamentals. So uh, a good tool you wanna do, learn is typing. You learn to type, it's gonna save you a lot of time. Uh, it's tedious, it's like riding a bike at first. It's like, you feel like you're not making progress, but just keep going, going, going. And usually after like six weeks or so, you, you start noticing that you're getting better, but you gotta practice. It's one of those things you have to practice like every day. And, 15, 20 minutes a day is, is good enough. That's all it takes. It's gonna save you so much time. The worst thing is an IT person that types with two fingers. Two, like, they call it the pecking method, where you have your two fingers, you like peck, 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 peck. And you can never be fast. Yeah. But if you learn to use all your hands, you can be as fast as you wanna be because the better you get, the faster you go. And it's gonna save you a lot of time when you have to write emails. It's like an investment in your time. You have to write papers, all of these things. Uh, uh, when I took typing class in high school, I hated that class, but it's one of the best things that I, I okay, see? See, now, like, then compared to now, they're not really teaching the kids in school the typing. typing? During, especially during the time when I was in school, we had our own CDs. They taught us where to put our fingers. fingers yep. So it's like, I'm still fast, but at the same time, I'm thankful for the typing thing that you have on the website because I noticed that I'm not as fast as I used to be. Okay, so you use so it. it. So I guess you have to use it to get faster. Okay, excellent. So one of the, the students is saying they're using the, the, the typing tool. So there are a couple of them here. These are things that will help you to type. And they're, and they're free. That's a good part. You know, you can just log in and practice, right? You can create an account and then it will track how you're doing. So the first one is this one. Uh, uh, and uh, you can just... You see that you just put your fingers and it goes through the lesson. So you can you can uh, you can literally go in and, and and practice your typing lesson by lesson by lesson. So this is the first one uh, teaching you typing. Another one is the uh, Education Club typing program. This one too you can create an account and to track how you're doing. But uh, these are some free tools 
that, that will help you. So again, the first step kind of tells you, explains to you how to use a typing program, and then you just walk your way through 18. Again, it's very, very important if you want to learn, for you to learn how to type. Typing is essential. So uh, that's why I included uh, those two in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the course. Now, um, so that's step one. And I actually added some other, uh, other videos. The second thing is we have a YouTube channel. So I, I'm asking, I'm pleading with all of you to subscribe to it. Uh, because what I'm going to be doing, we're going to be doing short videos like how to and, and, and even the courses that are being recorded. So you guys can always go back and watch it. And the thing is, once you subscribe, whenever we add a new video, you get an update saying, hey, there's a new video, there's something available. Okay, so, uh, 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 um, and that's, uh, and these are all pulling from YouTube. So if you go to YouTube, if you just type IMO Tech, IMO Tech Training, <clears throat> okay, if you do that, this is our channel. I'm a tech trainer, so just click on it, subscribe, and the videos we have will be uh, posted there to help you guys out. So that's the second thing. Now, that being said, uh, um, if we come to number two, this is what we covered on Saturday. We talked about the goal setting, the slides are here. This was a video, very inspirational video you can watch. And then these are the main points the video talks about. And here are the, the materials you were supposed to print, download, and then work on to set your goals. I hope you got a chance to do it. And remember, if you learn something, you don't use it, you know better off than the person who didn't know. It. But only when you've learned something and then you implement it, that's how progress is made, okay? So just be mindful of that. Um, and then today, here's what we're gonna, this is, this is a slide of what we're gonna cover. And after the class, maybe by tomorrow morning, the latest, I'll upload today's video because all the sessions are being recorded for those who cannot make it or who want to go back and review. So that being said, let's get to why we're here. Um, any questions before I get started? Hey, so, uh, oh, sorry, I just have a quick, quick question here. This is Katie. Um, so I signed up on the web on the portal today. I'm, I'm just waiting for, I guess, the confirmation email so I can access oh. the photo. So just a, just a quick so, comment. Uh, okay, um, my, uh, to be honest, uh, the, our system, our website, everything is being revamped. So there's some glitches here and there. Sometimes okay. it may not be an invite, but if you, if you did it earlier today, I've confirmed it. So you guys can try logging in. If you did, if you, Try uh, registering early today. I com I already confirmed it manually on my end. So oh, just uh, less, than, less, just less, less than less than an hour ago. Okay, if that's the case, and then just uh, after class, I'll confirm uh, uh, the rest of you. Okay, okay. so for Sounds now good. you're going to be following the slide. So I'll definitely confirm uh, you after uh, um, the session today. Okay. Okay. Sounds um, good. Thank you. Uh, um, okay. Um, give me a second for now. Since we're here, just follow. After the class, I will straighten everyone in up so we don't waste time, okay? But yeah, just bear with me. Uh, okay, so uh, again, please, if you're not um, speaking or you don't have a question, um, um, try to mute yourself um, because the uh, Again, I'm recording this session so people can hear it well without the background noise. So the way this class is gonna be, let me just give you guys a quick overview how we're gonna move forward, right? Uh, let me share. So today we're doing computer basics. Because not everybody in this class is on the same level, right? So even if you know a lot of these computer basics, I always say just pay attention. You may learn something you didn't know. And from there, what we're going to do, we're going to gradually move up to the next session we're going to do, uh, networking. All right? So networking will be next. And then we'll, after networking, we'll do some Linux, right? Linux is an operating system that's used a lot in IT. 
right? So we, I'm gonna give you guys the basics. And after that, we'll do some database and what's called SQL. SQL is a programming language that you use to, to communicate or uh, update databases, right? And by the end of this session, you should be kind of well-rounded in what a computer is, how networking works, those basic skills that you can run with. So, so for some of you that are gonna be taking our session, it will help you out. But for those of you that just wanna get good with computers, that's a good practice. And I'll give you some, some references, some tools you can use to practice this on your own. And if you wanna get good at IT, these are like some of the fundamental things you have to do and practice make perfect. So the typing, the learning and Linux command and some of these things. But today we're gonna start with just the basics of how a computer works. So think about it, it's like math. You just can't go and take calculus all of a sudden, right? You have to take, you first know how to do one plus one and you build from that. So that's kind of what we're doing, okay? So for those of you that feels like, oh, I already know some of this stuff, review doesn't hurt. And for those of you that are new to it, uh, then you can also um, uh, gain uh, some of the, the concepts here, okay? So that being said, uh, let's get to uh, our slides. So, so basically, this is a this this session is for those that are scared of computers, right? So, if you're scared of computers, this is for you. <laughs> if you feel lost on a PC, like uh, yep, this is for you, right? If you want to learn some basic skills. This is for you. And there's some terms we're gonna be talking about. And those key terms are, uh, we're gonna use talk about terms, functions, uh, security of a computer. So this is kind of the, the layout of what we're gonna be doing. It's also for you, your, your relatives, friends, who are all of above applied to. That's why we wanted to share that link. If you know somebody who wants to learn great uh you can share that link so they can join and, and improve their skills the computer skills right um again the notion is anything can be learned can be learned you're never too old to learn something people always say you can't teach a, a, a old dog new tricks i don't believe that you know learning stops when you're in the grave in my book all right so you can always keep learning uh so what to expect from this lesson? This particular lesson, we're going to learn how to use Windows PC. Also, we're going to understand some basic terms and concepts. Uh, we're going to understand some basic controls. You will know what those are. And also, we're going to uh, talk about the names of basic parts of a computer, right? You want to know the parts. So after today, you know, you should know exactly what's in your computer and how it works. Uh, Okay, what not to expect, like I said, we build in block, right? This is not a course that's gonna give you certification today. You're not gonna be certified. Uh, we're not gonna be talking about Macintosh, Apple, uh, or it's a joke, or pineapple, you know, get it, Apple, pineapple. Yeah, so we're not gonna be talking about that. Uh, uh, you're not gonna know everything about Windows or, or PC today. It's, it's, it's impossible, it's as, you get introduced as you get to know it. It's like a relationship, right? Your partner, you never, your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, uh, you never, uh, it took time for you to get to know them. And then it's not one day, but as you start interacting more with it, you learn more. So that's the concept here. Okay, we're not gonna teach you how to hack. That's a, that's a special course. <laughs> Everybody who wants to do cybersecurity for some reason wants to ask, hey, I wanna be a hacker. Okay, you not, it's like you say, I want to fly before I can even walk, right? So you got to learn cybersecurity, some of those concepts, those basic things, before you can get good enough to become a hacker. You just can't go straight and be a hacker, right? Okay, and also we're not going to show you how to build a computer. This is not that class, okay? Because some people like building their computer. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah. so let's get started. My question is, what is a computer? Who wants to take a shot at what is a computer? Anyone wants to volunteer and tell me what a computer is? Be brave. No one? Man, tough cloud. Yeah, 
So when it says something is stores and, and an electronic device that stores or transfers uh, data from one computer to another. Okay, so one said electronic device that stores and transfer data from one computer to another. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good guess. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Uh, any other guesses? Uh, somebody typed online. A set of programs it's run by. Okay. Can I try? Um, Jibril. Okay. So it it is it's it it is an electronic device um used for storing and processing data. Okay. Yeah. That's uh. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's yeah. a pretty good. Uh, all right. All right. So. The, so here's a definition of a computer. A computer is an electronic device that manipulates information or data. It has the ability to store, retrieve, or process data. Right? So again, it's, a, it's an electronic device that, that manipulates information or data. It also has the ability to, these are the key things, to, to store, retrieve, and process data, okay? So, and that's the official, again, the slides will be available. This slides I'm going through will be on the portal, so you guys can go through it if you, if you feel like you need to review. So, generally, a computer is a device that accepts input. Accepts input. And then, once it accepts input, uh, please mute yourselves. Uh, it processes it, right? Then, it stores the data and produces what's called an output. So if you think about it, this is kind of how a computer works. You put an input, it processes your input, and then gives you an output, and then possibly it also can store that output. Okay? So pay, uh, uh, um, pay attention to some of the stuff in red, because... Uh, so... So what can computers do, right? So most of us kind of have an idea what computers do, but here's some of it. You can create documents with computers. Uh, you can basically browse, go on the internet via computer. Uh, you can play video games, right? You can play computer games, all of those things on a computer. And also you can do things like editing in your pictures. Uh, you can create Excel spreadsheets. And uh, you can store all the form of data, right? Obviously, nowadays you can make videos and all of these things via your computer. So this is this is nothing new that you guys have been using. But again, uh, um, um, you need to understand it. So here is a little picture that kind of shows you the, the dichotomy of how you interact with computers, right? So number one. You're sitting in front of your computer and you type in something, right? What are you doing? You input in advice. You input it means you're putting in information. You're giving commands to the computer that you want it to do. You just don't go and sit in front of a computer and just to sit, right? You want to do something. So what do you do? You got to input. You provide input saying, this is what I want or this is what I want to do. So that's the input part, right? So once you put an input, you're telling the computer, I want to do certain things, right? Then what the computer does is it takes your input and then what does it do? It processes what you're trying to do, right? And then once it's processed what you're trying to do, what does it need to do? It's gonna now spit out an output saying, hey, you asked me to do so and so, here's what it is, right? You see it, that's the output. And based on that output, what can you do? You can store it, save it, or just move on, right? So if you just remember this process, this is what all, this is, this is the main concept of how computers work. You provide input and you keep that circle going as you interact with the computer. So these are the things. You, the human, provide input, process it, send output, and you can save it. Okay? So this is how information is processed. Uh, so next, we talk about input. Right? So now we, we're going to define them in a little more uh, times, right? So what's an input? Input is information provided 
to the computer by a person, the environment, or another computer? What do I mean by the environment? Obviously, you guys use it because you guys are typing, right? That's you giving input to a computer. How does the environment provide input to a computer? See, now I want you to think about your everyday life and how you interact with things, things that you see. Do you, do you, when you get your phone, does the phone tell you the weather? No. Your phone don't tell you? No. Oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> I know where you're going. I see. Yeah, it, it does, right? But where is it getting that? It's getting input from the environment, right? The, 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 the kind of, get that, right? And also, can computers talk from one computer to another? So input, so again, when you think about input, the most obvious answer is somebody sitting in front of a computer and giving input. No. Uh, uh, computers can get information from, uh, from the environment. It can get it from other computers that are interacting with it. So be mindful of that, right? So what are some examples of input? So, what, so think about what, are the, what type of information do you put in a computer, right? Do you put words and symbols? Do you type those in? Uh, yeah. Do you put in numbers? Yeah. Right? Do you input pictures in there? Yeah. Do you input some audio things in there? Yeah. Okay. When you're talking on a mic, right? You now have voice activation. Hey Siri, what's the weather like? What are you doing when you ask Siri? You're giving a voice, a microphone, an audio signal, right? Now, uh, can they can one computer send signal to another computer? Yes. Um, can you get temperature, speed, pressure? That's the environment we were talking about, right? Think about when the police is sitting there and you're speeding, what do they use, right? They have that, that thing is a computer that's processing how fast something is, is happening and it's saying this person is going so, so, right? So these are all things that are uh, uh, input, your speed, uh, your temperature, right? Your smartwatch, when you wear your smartwatch, what is it doing? It's tracking, your, 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 your body heat, your heart rate, it's taking input and, 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 as, and then it will tell you, hey, this is what I'm reading, and it processes it, compares it to other people's and what the average should be and say, hey, I think your heart rate is a little high, maybe you should sit down or you're not exercising enough. So it's, it's all, that's the input. So just think about input, it's not always you standing there. So these are the, the various devices. I put a picture here of some of the devices that provide input to a computer, your keyboard, you know, the number keypads, your mouse, you know, your scanner, your cameras, your microphone. These are all devices, example, not all of them, but these are some examples of input. Now you have like uh, the thumbprints, the bi biometrics, Biometric. right? So those are all inputs, right? So that's how you got to think about input, the different, how information goes into a computer from those things we talked about, right? Okay. So, So, so now once you've input the information, what happens? The information needs to be processed, right? So how do you define process, processing? Processing is basically manipulation of data, okay? Manipulation of data. So what's, what's the meaning of data? See, whenever you're talking about information data, you hear this word all the time, data, data, data. It's important to know what this knowledge mean, right? So, a, a processing when the computer process it basically takes and manipulates um, data that's been um, provided, right? So, what is data? Data is basically symbols that represent raw facts, objects, and ideas about people, places, events, things that are important in an organization. So. What is data? So uh, if I say today's class, there are 20 people in there, right? That's what data so just represent 20 people in today's class, right? Now, the next class, there are 40 people. That's another raw data, right? The next class, there are 30 people. That's another raw data, right? So data is just some facts about raw facts. It's just raw facts, right? When I say 20 people in 10 class, that's just a fact. It's raw. Now, when I'm giving all this information, the data is going in, right? If I ask the computer, say, hey, what is the average number of people that I've, I attended my class? What do you think is gonna do? 
is going to manipulate that data because day one, I said 20 people came to class. Day two, 30 people came to class. Day three, 40 people. Day four, 30 people again. I'm just giving raw data, right? But now that data becomes critical information when I ask it like, hey, what's the average number of people that attend in my classes, right? Now, what does the process it needs to do? It needs to go add all of those individual times, and then you can divide by five, and you say, this the average people that attend your class is five, right? That processing, it's manipulating data. Because what do you do? What do you, what, why, why is it manipulating data? It's taking this individual data, it's adding it. That, you see how it's manipulation? It's playing with it. Manipulate means I'm playing with it. And then it's going to divide it by the number of days, and then it's going to spit out an output, right? So that processing is taking raw data and manipulating that data to make sense with it, right? And here's the thing. In this day and age, data is the new gold. Data in, is the new gold. The reason why, think about companies that are very powerful, the Facebooks, the Googles, right? Why? Why is, why is Facebook so powerful? Because they collect data on what we like, what we, our activities are, right? So do you, you ever think why Facebook is free? Because of the, they sell data. Facebook is in the business of selling data. So when you go, you like dogs and they see all the people who likes what, who likes what. So if somebody is selling, uh, let's say dog collars, right? If you just go and bought a new dog, you say, I like dogs, you know, they're gonna gather all information of people who just bought dogs, right? And they're gonna provide, sell that information to dog color company right so now they can those companies can use that information to target you because they know you just bought a dog more than likely you're gonna buy a you need a caller it's just like that have you guys ever gone like on amazon one of these places buy a phone and next thing you know it's popping up for you to buy a case yeah the, raw, the what's the fact the fact is you purchase a phone right Mm -hmm. And then they will track all the people who just purchased phones. And then they know if you bought a phone, you're more likely to what? Buy a case for it. So it's targeted marketing, very, very effective. So that's how Facebook makes money. They sell information to companies that are trying to sell products or services. So it's called targeted marketing and it's very, very powerful. Before, what, what did you do? You go, you print information in a newspaper and then you send it out maybe 5% of the people, you spend a lot of money, maybe 5% of the people will buy your product. But with the targeted marketing, they know exactly what you like. They know who to target. See how that works? Mm -hmm. they're, all, they're using data. That's why I said the person that collects data is gold because they, data is, is, you can use data to predict what people like, what they don't like, how they behave, you know, some of these things. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, Think about the computer manipulating data is just facts, factual information about some of these things. That the processing manipulates that data to make sense out of it, something out of it that you want. That's the processing part, right? So just remember that. Again, when you're learning these things, don't try to be too technical, just use it. Okay, data is just fact. I like don't key. And then what? Manipulating means you're crunching these numbers and then you're trying to give me an average. So when you ask it, say, what's one plus one? The fact is one and one. The processing is gonna say one plus one is gonna merge those exactly. two and spit out our output savings too, right? Yeah. So not scary, right? <laughs> so what are some examples of processing? Calculators, right? So your computer can do mathematical calculations. You can say two plus two, stuff like that. It can sort. You can put a list of names and say, hey, sort them by alphabetical order first name. It will sort it for you. What is it doing? It's manipulating data to sort it, right? That's not how you put it, but you can do that. You can also edit pictures, right? Man, Photoshop. We have some Photoshop kings and queens that is nowadays, right? <laughs> you see the pictures that they post and then you go in real life like, oh, is this the right person I just saw? <laughs> but so that's the, you manipulated it. That's a, a, a um, part of um, uh, what happens, right? Can you draw graphs and charts? Yes, that's also part of uh, our processing, right? A signal from one computer to another. That's also processing how you can say, hey, call out of the computer. The process of this computer saying, reaching out to the other computer, that's, that's part of processing your request, right? Mm -hmm. And then also it can do it for temperature, speed, pressure, 
etc. like sensors, right? Like uh, those biometric sensors and stuff like that. It, it, it can process all of that information. Okay. Whoops. So last is output. So remember input process output, right? So output the results produced by a computer after processing the data, right? So input, manipulation data, output is the results, the final product after it's manipulated the data that you're asking for, right? So for you to have those, you need to have what's what are called output devices, right? What are those? The output devices are the display, your monitor, because that's where you can see what you asked for, right? If you click, say, open this video, the video start playing, the output is gonna be on your monitor, your device, right? It can print, your printer can print out outputs, right? So you gotta, whole thing is you gotta think about these things as they, they, they all have a purpose. It's like your, your body. Every part of your body has a purpose, right? You will know that they, you will know your thumb is important until you hurt it, or your toe, your, your pinky toe, right? That's where you know, man, this tool is, uh, is, is very important. But when everything is working, it seems seamlessly, right? So just keep, keep that in mind. Uh, you can also transmit the results after processing that, things that are of importance in an organization. organization. So transmit, you can, devices that transmit information, right? So these are some of the things you gotta think about when you talk about output, right? What are some examples of output? Images on a monitor, uh, printing document from your computer, sound, sounds such as playing like you record your voice and you hear it again or you listen to music. These are all, you click play on, a, on the keyboard and then your music start playing, right? Signal to control other devices, right? Signal to control other devices. You ever think about a traffic light, how it works? It's a computer program that's telling the light to switch, right? Green, red, light, white, green, white, green, red, and yellow. So all of that, you have a computer that's signaling another device to do something, right? You have these cars now that, uh, that the new cars that will check the lane. If you're swerving out of your lane, it will bring you back because it's, it's a, so the computer in the car is affecting the, steering wheel to bring you back in and then it will stop if you see like you're going too fast and something is, is in front of you. So again, we're interacting with these things, but you just got to start paying attention to how these things work. And then when you become nosy and you're curious, that's how you start learning more about certain things. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. So what are the major computers, right? So we have desktops, we have laptops, and uh, we have tablets. A lot, some people don't consider tablets, but even smartphones are computers. Those things are powerful computers. They're becoming more powerful than a computer. How often do you use your computer now? Not that much, right? Because everything is on your phone. You can check your emails, you can write your paper, you can text, you can. So the computer, the, the, the smartphones has basically cannibalized a lot of the devices. Remember when the Walkmans were around, the MP3 players? Remember when the um, navigation system like the, were around, you put in your car? Mm -hmm. you, you remember that? Yeah. You remember when the, the, you had the, these cameras you were taking pictures with? What has happened? The smartphone just killed all those industries because it consolidated all of them. Mm -hmm. So again, sometimes you just see how technology moves and you see that, you know, uh, 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 certain things. So it's, that's why the, the prices of phones are going up why computers and some other things are coming down because you will be becoming more dependent on them. So, uh, so those are the types of computers, right? So um, desktop, many people use desktops to do their work and uh, basic stuff in the office or at home, right? So that's, again, bear with me, some, some people, uh, this is brand new to them. So the parts that are kind of I know that, just hang with me, okay? So this is what a desktop looks like. And they call it desktop because this thing sits on top of your desk, right? Cool. <laughs> so <laughs> that name was very creative, right? <laughs> so laptops, ah, uh, okay. Smaller device that sits where? Lap. On your lap. I used to call it lab, laptop. 
And then when I saw it, I'm like, oh, laptop, lap. Oh, it makes sense now. I'm like, laptop, what am I doing, labs on this? That was years ago when, you know, I, I heard like laptop. Because I it sounds like laptop. But laptop, it sits on your lap. You can work on it from your lap. Smaller devices, compact, and mobile. That's the major difference between laptops and the desktops, right? Okay. Um, so, tablets. Tablets are basically handheld devices, right? And the key, what's the, major, what's the big difference between a tablet and a desktop and laptop? What do, does the tablet not have that a desktop and a laptop has? The keypad. The keypads. You got to type. You have a keyboard to type. Everything is on the screen, right? So that's the major difference between the tablet and a lot of the, and, and, and the, the, the computers. Uh, uh, you know, it doesn't have the keyboard. You, I mean, you can attach external ones, but that's the whole point, okay? But it does the same thing that a computer, a desktop or a laptop does, okay? And our smartphones, right? So smartphones, handheld devices that are even more portable than the tablets. We can do voice call, send text, emails, photos, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things are computers, right? And do they meet our definition of computer, of what a computer is? Device that takes input, process your input, gives you output, and can also store that output, right? Yeah. Do, that, do that meet the definition of yeah, it? Yeah. See how, see, not that difficult. You just think about it in, in, in that. That's all it is. That's all a computer is, right? Input, process, output, store. If a device can do that, it's a computer, okay? Next, uh, now we get to see the parts of a computer. So, there are two major parts of a computer. You have the hardware and you have the software. Hard, soft, hard, soft, hardware, software. So whenever you're talking about a computer, it's like the yin and the yang, like the husband and wife. One needs the other. They both kind of have to work together, right? So hardware is any part of a computer that has a physical structure, which means you, like a keyboard, you can touch it. So the hardware by itself is a physical part. If you open a computer, you start looking the parts in there. If you can, if you can touch it, that's a hardware. If I can touch it and feel it, that's a hardware, right? So your laptop itself is a hardware, right? You open a, inside a laptop or computer, there's some components in there. Those are all part of your hardware. Now, the hardware is useless without, so these are some example, right? So in this example here, you see that the mouse, this is, these are what you call peripherals. Right? They like additions like your your mouse, your keyboard, the pen. These are all peripherals, your printers, things that you add to the computer to give it value, right? So, but the major part of a computer is the motherboard. So I think of the motherboard like a, it's like the mother, the mother of a family, right? Keeps everyone together. The motherboard takes all the individual components and they all get slot in the motherboard so they can work together as a family. So that's kind of how I think about it, motherboard. Oh, mom keeps the family close. The devices inside of a computer can be separated. They're useless. But once you get, you slot them all on the motherboard, they all become this one unit, they work together, right? Yeah. So motherboard, mother keeps the family together, you know? So that's how you remember that. And there are other things that go on the motherboard that we're gonna talk about shortly that you should know. Right? So no, major thing inside of a computer is the motherboard. Usually if the motherboard goes bad, guess what you need? A new computer, right? Mm -hmm. Moms are special again, right? So I like that maybe if it it's all well, the mothers out there, it kind of it kind of fits that, that. So the motherboard is the key that holds all the puzzles of a hardware. Can we touch all of these parts? Yes. yes. Hardware, if I can touch it, it's a hardware. It's hard. Okay, so the next part of it is software. The hardware is not as important, it is, is nothing without the software, right? The, the software is nothing without the hardware. They kind of work together. So hardware by itself, just a piece of metal, they have no use to you. Can you use it? 
but with the software now, it becomes useful, okay? So let's keep those two distinguished um, uh, factors, right? So now, some of the hardware is the computer case. The computer case is just the case that covers to protect the internal part of a computer, right? So in a laptop, it's the aluminum or whatever plastic that, that covers, you know, but this is what basically on desktop or computer case is just the outside shell, okay? Uh, so you see plastic metal case that just protects the outside shell of a computer, right? So, but inside the computer, there's some parts that we have to be very, that's very important. So in this example, it's called what? CPU. CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. So you hear, hey, can I have the CPU? Sometimes they get interchangeable. If you have a desktop, a desktop has what? What, how many, usually a desktop will come with what, how many parts? A desktop. Yeah, how many parts? Actually, four. If, if, yeah. But three, the mouse, the keyboard, the, the CPU, and the monitor, right? So sometimes if they're talking about the whole CPU, it means the, the, this, this part. But this is just a name given to a, a very important part that's inside the computer, okay? So we're going to distinguish. So it depends how it's being used. If somebody says, hey, can you hand me the CPU when they talk about desktop? You should know they want you to bring the whole thing. But the other times when we talk about CPU, it means something else. And there's a reason why they call it that, okay? So the CPU in this case is the whole unit, right? Mm -hmm. And in the back of it, there's a power supply. The power, the power bank is in the back in, in, in the desktop like this. And that's one, that's the part that connects to your, that gives the whole thing power. The power bank is what connects to your outlet and then powers what? The motherboard where everything is on, right? That electricity goes around and then powers all the things so they can work. So the power bank is what brings in power to distribute on your devices that are on the CPU, right? Again, the motherboard, I already said what that is, right? It's where most of the components get put in, right? So the motherboard mix is the part that kind of helps all the different units of a computer work together as a single unit, right? Okay. There's another part that goes on the motherboard that's important. What's that? That's the RAM. RAM stands for random access memory. Random access memory is what's known as like temporary storage. Temporary storage, right? That's what the RAM does. I would, you know more what, what that means in a little bit. And then here's the brain. The, the brain of the computer is called a processor. It's a very small part but it's very, very powerful. You notice when your computer is working hard, what happens to it? When, no, when it's working hard, there's something, it gets hot. You hear that fan blowing hot hair, right? You know what that is? That's the processor. The processor is the brain of a computer. And it basically gives order to the other things of what to do. It works very, very hard but it gets hot. So what happens is usually there's aluminum. Aluminum is pretty good at absorbing heat. Aluminum is a pretty good uh, uh, heat absorber, right? Mm -hmm. So they put, how it's made, they put an aluminum on top of the processor. And what is it doing? As the processor gets hot, the aluminum is what? It's sucking the heat, right? And there's a fan in the computer that's blowing that heat out. If it doesn't do that, your processor is gonna burn out. So that's why when your computer is working hard or struggling, you hear that fan running. So, because it's exuding a lot of heat, okay? So, the processor is the brain of your computer. It's the one that processes your request, right? That's why they call it the brain. Think about it like this. Your brain. You know your brain is one of the biggest consumers of calories in your body? It's, it's, it's very small compared to the rest of the body, but it consumes quite a big chunk of it because it has to do so much work. So think about the processor, it's the same thing, it's the brain of the computer. It's small, but it does a lot of the lifting. So sometimes when you go buy a computer, you know those hundred dollars, two hundred dollar computer, those hundred dollar computers, like oh, it looks good. A lot of times the 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 
The processor is very cheap. It's weak. So it's cheap. The more tasks you want the, uh, the work to do, the higher the processor needs to be. So when you talk about those 1,000 and up computers, those expensive computers, they have a higher, a better processor, like an i7 or i5. These are like the super processors that can, can do more. Okay, so just think about that that way. The, the key things you need to remember, you need to know is the RAM, which is temporary storage, the processor, which is the brain of the computer, and the hard drive. The hard drive is storage, permanent storage. So here's how I remember those three. This, you should definitely memorize these things, right? So the way I memorize it is this. The processor and the RAM are brilliant professors. They can do a lot of work. They can do mathematical equation. They can do processing. They can do all the great work in the world, but they have a problem. As soon as they go to sleep, they forget everything that they did. So the hard drive is the diligent assistant that's writing all the work they've done. So when they wake up, say, hey, guys, this will be left off. What's the advice when they tell you your phone is acting up? It's just acting up. What's, the, what's one of the advice they always tell you? What, what's the first thing you should do if your phone or your computer is just not working right and it's just acting up? Reboot it. Turn it off and turn it back on, right? Yeah. You know why? The RAM, the RAM, so the RAM, basically what happens is this. The RAM is, is temporary storage. In fact, when you look in your computer, this, what you're seeing in your screen right now is what's in RAM. What you're seeing on your screen is what's inside of RAM. Now the RAM, they call it random access memory because whenever you open a program, let's say you wanna open Microsoft Word, right? Microsoft Word gets opened inside of the RAM. When you type in, you're typing inside of the RAM. When you wanna watch a movie, the movie is gonna get open inside of the RAM. It's temporary storage. So what happens if your computer doesn't have a lot of RAM and you open a lot of, part of um, a lot of applications in your computer? What happens? It gets slow, why? Think about the storage. It doesn't have enough space for you to cram all of these things. So what happens is when you wanna use this program, it has to take this one out, the, the other program outside and then bring this one. Once in the, so that time of going back and forth, it's slow. That's why when you have a computer that has eight gig, it means that you have twice the amount of space, storage, te temporary storage. The processor works only inside of the RAM. So the processor does the work. It's the brain of the computer, but it only works in RAM. So you wanna open a program, you wanna work on a program, the program gets open inside of the RAM and your processor goes to work. Right? So together, they work. They did brilliant professors. But as soon as you turn them off, the RAM gets wiped out. It gets cleared out. That's why when your computer is acting up, they say turn it up. Because what happens is if the RAM is uh, full and it's acting slow, when you turn it off, the RAM is going to get erased. Everything in it is going to get cleared out. Yeah. So when you start it again now, it's fresh. You can start opening part, uh, your, your, up your stuff again but it's temporary storage. So when you write, you hit save. That's where the hard drives comes in. It's permanent storage. When you write in your Microsoft Word, you type in your paper, you hit save. It's taking it from temporary storage and making that save permanently. So even if the RAM goes off, you've already made it, you've saved it permanently. The hard drive job is to save. It's permanent storage, it just saves your, your work, your stuff permanently until you manually say, I want to delete it. So RAM processor, brilliant, brilliant professors, they can do all the great works, but they have an amnesia. Once you turn them off, everything gets cleared out. This is what's called volatile. Like that crazy boyfriend or girlfriend, right? Very, very, they can go from zero to a hundred real quick. Uh, it's volatile because when they go down, Everything gets you know, wiped out. But the hard drive is what's known as persistent. It's persist. It just keeps 
-hmm. cool and storm. Volatile, persistent. Volatile, persistent. So these are, I'm, I'm re-emphasizing this point so you guys know what these are, okay? So what are the three parts of a computer that are very, very important? RAM, uh -huh, hard drive, processor. processor. And what part of the computer kind of makes all of these people work together? The motherboard. the motherboard, right? And everything. So, and what kind of, um, what, 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 what are the major things that you need needed in the computer whole rotation? The cycle, the computer cycle, you need what? Mm -hmm. You put input and then what happens? Okay. It processes. Okay. And once it processes, who does the processing? Where is the processing done? Where is the processing done? We just talked about it. Think about it. Who are the brilliant professors? The Raman the processor. That's where the processing occurs, right? And once they've processed it, what happens? They display the output, right? And that output can be permanently stored where? Hard drive, right? See how the cycle works? These two guys do all the processing, they do all the work. The, the CPU does the work, but it does it inside of the RAM. And once it's done that, it spits out an output. That output can be displayed. And if you want to make it permanent, what do you do? You save it on a hard drive, because the hard drive is that meticulous assistant that writes down everything that they do. Make sense? Okay, any questions so far? Okay, uh, so, the front, again, of the computer usually has the on and off button and one or more optical drive. What are the optical drive? Who can tell me what's an optical drive? Optical drive. So what did I say, the hard drive? Huh? A hard drive is a permanent storage, right? So if we're talking about optical drive, optical drive, who, who can give me an example of where the optical drives are? Optics. The USB ports. CD. This, some of the CD ROMs. So this optic, this other peripherals can go in there, right? Mm -hmm. You can put a CD in the CD drive, right? You can put a USB yeah. in a USB port, right? These are the optical drives, right? Okay. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Uh, So, again, for those that are new, this is a monitor, right? And the monitor does what? The monitor works with a video card. So, there's usually a video card that does what? So, you can display, right? Locate it inside the case to display images and text on the screen. Most monitors have control buttons that allow you to change what? The monitor display setting and so forth and so on, right? So it has a video card. So you're going to hear this word. Video card means it's, the, it's a card that goes in that allows you to transmit uh, the visual part, right? So what type of device is this? Input, processing, or output? Output. Output. Good. One for one. All right. So next one. Keyboard is what it looks like. The keyboard is one of the main ways to communicate with your computer. There are many different types of keyboards, but most are very similar and allow you to accomplish the same basic task, right? Input. Uh, of, so what type of device is this? If I give you guys a hand. <laughs> I jumped the gun on this one. Yeah. But somebody's probably going to say output. Nah, um, so it is an input device, right? Again, I'm trying to, that you guys keep thinking of input, process, output, storage. Input, process, output, storage. Keep thinking of that. That's the whole cycle that keeps repeating, right? And just understand where these things take place. Processing takes place where? Come on. Where does the processing take place? Inside the, um, inside the, inside the processor. Processor the and the RAM. The RAM. RAM. They work together. Those guys are like twins on the hips, right? They work together. Processor and RAM work together. Processor only works inside of the RAM. The RAM is temporary storage that allows you to open application in there. That's why if you have a phone, one of those Chinese phones, as soon as you start opening two or three apps, man, that thing started start getting slow because you don't have enough RAM and then also the processor maybe not, is not as good. 
Okay. So then next one, mouse. Why do you think they call him a mouse? Because remember the mouse? It, it, it has a little tail. Remember? Yeah. The first mouse, the mouse that connects, it looks like a little mouse with a tail. That's why they call it a mouse, because it's that's what it looks like. So the mouse is another important tool for communicating with your computer. Commonly known as pointing device. I wonder why. Uh, it lets you point to object on the screen, click on them, and you can move them, right? That's what the mouse does. They want to type sometimes, but it looks like a little mouse with a tail. That's why, even though now most of the mouses are, are wireless, but that's why they call it a mouse, because that's what it looks like. So the two main types of mouse, the optical and mechanical. The optical mouse uses an electronic eye to detect movement. The optical mouse are the ones that have a little infrared. It doesn't have the, 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 the mechanical one is the one that uses a little ball. You don't see those anymore. Back in the days, you have the, the little ball on the mouse and sometimes it gets dirty. You have to take it out, wipe it and put it back in. That's, that was optical. That was the electronical one. But um, you don't see that. You don't see those, um, uh, you don't see those anymore. So most of the mouse you see now are optical mouse where they have some type of infrared that makes it move. Which one is better? Optical. Mm -hmm. Exactly, the optical one, infrared one. Okay. So, so what kind of device is the mouse? Input, output, or? Think about it, it's, it's input. It's an input device, because what do you do? You click on it, what happens? Something has to happen, right? Yeah. So just, just think about it. When you wanna watch a movie on your computer, what do you do? You click on it, you tell the computer, open it. Okay. So you give it an input and then the computer now will open it, right? When you wanna pause a movie, you click pause, right? Yeah. So you will give an input. So the mouse is an input device, okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so just think about the use. And the processing takes place in the, remember, processing is a manipulation of data. So when you double click on a movie, what is it gonna do? There's a file. What is gonna happen? The processor and the, the RAM are now gonna manipulate the data. They're gonna start playing that music because just a file, they're gonna start streaming it, right? Mm -hmm. That's manipulating the file to do something. When you hit pause, what are they doing? They're stopping it, right? If you just think about it that way, but all that is being done inside of the RAM and who's doing the work? The processor. When you open a movie, the movie is being played inside of the RAM. But who's pausing and playing and stopping? It's the processor that's doing all that work. Just keep remembering that. Okay, so now that we've gotten the hardware out the way, let's talk about software. Now, there are two types of software, right? You have what's called the operating system. The operating system, the software that supports the computer basic function, right, is the operating system. So here's how I want you to remember the two things, right? So a computer by itself is what? A computer by itself is called what? This is a PC. PC. Hardware or software. Just a computer. So. You see that most of the computers you have there are made by different companies, right? Yeah. HP, Dell, all of these things, right? When they make it, when they make these computers, right? They're just hardware. They just produce the hardware, right? Yeah. That's it. Now, that's all you have. The hardware is what the manufacturer makes. Now they finish making the computer, no problem. So, one of the reasons why Microsoft dominated the market is how smart they were, they were when the programs were coming out. In every market, the competition. You, some of you may be too, a little young, but you guys remember when the DVD, uh, the Blu-ray came out? Yeah. There were two types that came out. There were two different DVD 
a company that came out. And the regular, the DVD players, we have the, H, the, the, the DVD players that won. They went, they were able to win because they went and approached all the big motion picture companies and say, hey, sign with us, go with our product. Even when the cassette, again, dating myself a bit, when the cassette player came out, there were two, Atari and another, there were two type of cassette, cassette players that came out. But the one, VHS won because VHS was able to, it's dominance to the market. Usually when, when products come out, they compete. And then one, one who's strategic or whatever, who's better used or whatever, tends to win. So when the PC uh, uh, manufacturer started making the PCs, right? Microsoft went to them and said, hey, here's what we're gonna do. We want you, we're gonna give you permission to install our program into your computers and just give us a little piece of the pie. We're not gonna go in the hardware business so we're never gonna compete with you guys. We're gonna just produce nice software that can make your products more useful. That's how they were able to dominate the market because then I don't see you as a threat. Plus you're gonna add value because your program is good. So that's how Microsoft became the, uh, the, 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 the leader in software. Plus it made it easy because they use graphics like the mouse clicking on things. They made it easy for somebody who doesn't know computer programming, how to write codes to use a computer. So the, 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 the difference between making it easy and then also um, smart marketing and working with the, the, the producers of the hardware, they were able to dominate the market, right? So the PC by itself is just a hardware. Now, here's another fact. Computers talk in what's called binary. B-I-N-E-R-I, binary. Who can tell me what binary means? By. Two. Two. So they speak a language called zero and one. one. That's all computers talk. When they talk to them, each other, they speak in binary. You guys will see more when we get to networking, how exactly that works, but they speak in binary, right? Numbers. Yeah, the combination of like this, something like this, some weird, but the, how the numbers come in order can create everything from pictures to sound to everything else you can create on a computer. They can convert those things into binary, okay? So that being said, what um, you gotta think about is, do we speak binary? Would you understand binary, you as a person? No, right? So the hardware, the computers, they're talking binary. But the software, they're talking, but uh, uh, we don't speak binary. Is, it, is this a problem? Yes or no? The computers speak in binary, zeros and ones. But we talk in regular language, words and languages, right? Is there a conflict, is there a problem between this, between us and the computer then? Right? Yeah. So there's a person that comes in between, there's an interpreter. If you speak Chinese and I speak English, or you speak uh, uh, German and I speak English, right? How can we talk to each other? How can we communicate? What do we need? An interpreter. interpreter. You need an interpreter, right? You need an interpreter. So the software is an interpreter. The operating system, the OS, the operating system is the interpreter. Because what it does is, this is your computer. And you're gonna what? The first thing you're gonna do, you're gonna install the operating system. You're gonna install the operating system. Why do you install the operating system? Because we don't speak zeros and one. We don't speak binary, right? So the operating system sits on top of the hardware. And now it's gonna be the middleman between us, the humans that are using it, and the computer. So your computer, first of all, is non-usable until you first do what? Install an operating system. So the operating system is that middleman. Now, the OS, how I think about it, is interpreted between us and the computer. The hardware itself by itself, it speaks binary, we speak our, our languages. So the operating system is what allows us to, to do things, right? From machine uh, who can language tell? to human language. Exactly, from machine language to human language. So that is what the operating system does. So if you remember that, it, it will save you a lot of, and you see that it says, 
Computer basics, it, the software that supports a computer basics function, such as scheduling tasks, executing application, and controlling peripherals. What are peripherals? The input and output. But yeah, input output. But what are exactly are the peripherals themselves? Yeah, so the the peripherals, USB, USB yeah. the mouse, yeah. the keyboard, even the monitors. These are all peripherals, like parts of that part that you connect, okay. printers, things that you connect to a computer or peripherals, right? Yeah. 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 So just yeah, okay. That's what they are. Um, so. Now, there are two types of operating systems. You have what's called open source and closed source. Who can tell me what those are? Who can guess what open source and closed source are? How we go. So open source is um, like free market. Everybody can access to it. You can take and modify and make your own. And the other one is like you have to pay or like you know, uh, Windows or stuff. So, Linux is like open source. You, you can take it and modify and make your own. And I think that's it. Uh, pretty good. Yeah, almost, almost there, but not quite. But pretty good, pretty good. So, a uh, two things in, in in the market. Open source. It's a is code made what? freely available and maybe redistributed and modified. Okay, pretty good. Yeah. Okay, so there's some pretty good guesses here. Uh, pretty accurate. So here's the thing. Open source means what? So I'm a programmer. I don't have a company and I have a code for software. And what I do is I show you how the back end of the software, how it is and say you can modify it to fit your own computer. I don't care, right? You can modify it to meet your own system and you can use it as you see fit. That's open source. So closed source says, this code is mine. You can't play with it. You can't tinker with it. You can only use it like you're supposed to use it. Like I give it to you. Like I give it to you. So a good example of closed source is Microsoft. Microsoft, when you get their products, they tell you, you got, you know, you know, when you try to install a software and they give you that long thing you're never going to read saying you have to check it, agree to it. Agree. Yeah, that's so they can come after you if you don't, if you don't do, if you don't use it like they agree, they can take you to court and, and you'll be in trouble. They're saying don't mess around with our stuff, just use it as we have it. You can't go in the back end and try to uh, uh, mess with it. No. Open source says, here's the code. We're making it available to the world. You guys can use it. You can modify it to fit your environment. And you're, you're welcome to make changes to it to make it better. Somebody says it's because one is free, one is. So uh, an example of an open source is Android. You know who owns Android? Google. Google. Google owns Android. And the reason why, when um, Google acquired the company that, owned, that created Android, you know, these big companies, they will buy other companies, they grow, just like Facebook acquired WhatsApp, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever. So they just, the bigger boys will buy the other companies to add value. So when uh, Google bought Android, they had a choice. Do we make it closed source? Do we make it open source? Now, Apple, iOS, is that closed source or open source? Oh. Closed, because Apple says we own this, don't mess around with the code, it's our proprietary property. So when Google purchased Android, Google wanted to have more impact on mobile devices, right? So they had a choice. Do we make it closed source or do we make it open source? And Google decided to go say, we're gonna make Android open source. The reason why is this, if we make it open source, we allow people to modify it, to build on it, right? What are we gonna do? We're gonna dominate the market similar to what Microsoft did, right? Microsoft is closed source, but they like, you know, they allow like other companies to 
So you slowly say we share the profit. But this one, Android, they said you can modify it to fit your environment. And so what happens is that's why Android dominates the market in mobile devices. Because a lot more people use Androids. If you watch um, uh, Apple, they have a very small niche, first of all, price wise. But Apple is close off to the extreme because Apple controls everything about their products. Very They're very restrictive. On the other hand, you have Android who says, build, you know, we're giving you freedom to build. So you see how two different business models are and how they work. Now, here's my question What's the bad thing about <laughs> open source? What's the bad thing about open source? Oh, it's too much manipulation okay. for like a common ground. Okay. With it being open like that, doesn't that make it easy access for people to actually like get to things? So, please mute yourselves. Because with Apple being, you know, the way it is, it makes it difficult for people to actually get into stuff, which is what people complain about. So they prefer Android. So you see, that's the, it's the opposite. Hello? It's actually the opposite. So yeah, the question is yeah. somebody, I asked. Yeah, sometimes open source suffers delays. They have what? It suffers delays. In delays, development, okay. yeah, delays in development. Yeah, so yeah, that's a, that's a, that's, so whole lot of thought, but I'll come to that. So first, um, somebody said uh, the open source is easier to hack into because people have access to it, right? Yeah. But it's the opposite though, when you think about it. Here's what happens. When you have the code and all you say, you can modify the code to fit your environment, right? Open source means you have thousands of thousands of thousands of developers, people who are pretty good software engineers that are looking at it. So guess what? It's like you have a whole army looking at this stuff and they can find vulnerabilities. So they can find vulnerabilities and say how to make it better. So here's a, let me tell you guys something. Who uses Firefox? Firefox browser. That's an open source. It's one of the secure browsers. I prefer Firefox than um, Internet Explorer, which is owned by Microsoft. The reason why is you have a community of people who are like, hey, these are vulnerabilities. So you have a lot of more resources that are looking to make the product better. But if you work for Microsoft, Microsoft has to pay the engineers, right? Maybe they still have 10 people that work there that are in charge of making sure the application is safe. Now, 10 people, but thousands of people who are looking at it. Who, who can be more secure? That's, people always think the, the open source stuff is easy to hack into, but not quite. Because you have more eyes looking at it, people can find vulnerabilities and let, just because it's open source doesn't mean you can just. Well, you, but sir, um, mm -hmm. when we say that like, the more people you, you have, mm -hmm. it makes it open to everybody to. You know. No, no, no. Don't misconstrue, people have an act. People have a mean like, okay, you can modify. Modify means, let's say I want a business and I'm a website developer. And I don't need, for example, what I mean modify is, is this. When you go and install Microsoft Windows, what they give you on the disk is gonna install everything on your computer, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't need all the features of Microsoft. You only need one part of it. In open source, you can pick what you want to do your work, to suit your, own to suit your own purpose. It doesn't mean you can just tinker, tinker with it. You can customize it to fit your own. If I don't need all of this stuff being dumped on my computer, I only need this part of it. You can customize it to only get what you want. That's the beauty about open source. You can customize it. Customization doesn't mean you can just, you know, the code is there, it's available. But, so don't misconstrue that. Now, the fact that a lot of people are seeing the backend code you have better people who can find what the vulnerabilities are to close those vulnerabilities. Now, in IT, you can never be 100% safe. If anybody tells you that, they're lying to you. Hackers, a smart hacker can always find, because this, this is how IT works. IT, like let's say this is your computer. Oops. Uh, let me share here. 
let's say this is your computer, right? And this ring here is protecting your computer. All a hacker needs <laughs> is there, that little spot, he's gonna get in. So, usually it's hard to make this 100% secure. So hackers are always one step ahead. Now, the key is to make it so difficult that it's not worth trying. A lot of people think um, Apple is safer than Microsoft because Apple makes its closed source. You know, I, Apple, most of the time, people, it's harder to hack into Apple than Windows. It's the reward. This is the market for Windows. People, that, computers that have Windows. This is the market for Apple. If I'm a hacker, which one is going to be a bigger reward? There are way more people here than here. So if I'm hacking, I'm going to spend more time here trying to break it because this is where the majority of people are than this. It's rewards. Right? That's why Macs have less viruses. It's very safe, safe and secure. But it's the amount, a lot of times it's the amount of work that you got to put in just to get a fraction of the people that are using it. Where the big chunk of the reward is, if I'm a hacker, this is what I want. So that's why you see a lot of more viruses here because this is like 90 something percent of the market and compared to like three or so percent of the market here. Which way are you gonna waste your time? Here. That's why windows tend to be more vulnerable. But people always think, oh, Mac is closed. It's a reward thing. Yeah, it's secure, don't get me wrong. But it's the hackers want big bang for the bucks, right? So that being said, um, so don't let somebody fool you say, oh, because of, um, uh, because of you, uh, you want to share, uh, let me share this. People can't see my screen. So, uh, that's one of the reasons why, right? So, so open source, everybody can, uh, but. So, I, so actually the, the, the problem with closed source is vulnerable to attacks because you don't have too many people working on it. You have only specific people working on it. Uh, for Microsoft Windows, you only have the Windows engineers that are working on it. And they're humans. If they miss something, somebody can hack in there. This is why in uh, 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 a lot of times they have to put resources there. But since you pay these people, you can only pay so much money to make it work. But in open source, it's free. You have a whole army of people that are looking into the code and they can find vulnerability and say, hey guys, there's a problem here. And usually you have a body like uh, uh, um, um, Firefox. You have a body, you have a group of people that are making sure it's working well, right? We have people who are giving them feedback, say, hey, look this, fix this, fix this, so they can make it safer. So that's one thing. So yeah, the good news is more eyes on it. The bad news is What's the bad thing about uh, open source? So it's not what you guys were thinking. The bad news is support. If you, have, if you have Microsoft and you open Microsoft and you have a problem with Microsoft not working right, do you have somebody to call and say, hey, this is not working right? Do you think about it. If you buy a software for Microsoft and there's a problem with the software, do you, have, do you know where to go to contact that, that company and say, there's a problem here? Yes or no? Are you sure? I've not bought any so I don't know why I do. Yes, you do. If I have a product with Microsoft Word, or if I have a product problem with Microsoft Office, Microsoft owns it. I can reach out to Microsoft and say, hey, there's a bug, there's a problem, this thing is not working, it's supposed to. You know who to contact. But with open source, since people are customizing, sometimes it's hard to find support. You can set in your environment, but if something, let's say you customize it to your environment and something breaks, it's hard to find somebody that can help you. You got to now guess some guy in UK, some guy in Europe, or some guy in India or wherever, Africa, to help you figure out that problem. So sometimes the problem with open source is to get support, somebody who can help you fix issue when there's a problem. That's one of the drawbacks of open source, the support part of it. Microsoft, 
they have customer service. People complain and they will put patches together, all the complaints people have, and then they will roll them out. If you have a problem, you call them, hey, I bought your product, it's not working right. So Microsoft, you know what to get. But a lot of times, the open source, it's hard to find people that can help you. Does that make sense? So it's not always clear cut, but just think about it. The good thing is you have a lot of eyes watching it for vulnerability. The bad thing is when something goes wrong, it's hard to find somebody that can help you, you know, fix it for the most part. So, uh, so that's between open source and closed source. So just be mindful of that. And an example of open source is Android and Linux, Linux operating system. A lot of big companies use enterprise, not for house, for businesses, they use Linux. Okay, so that's open source. And closed source are like Windows and Apple iOS. Those are closed source because they control the code. They don't want you messing with it. They don't share it. They just want you to use it like that. So these are good examples of open source and closed source. Okay. So Windows is what? Windows is an, operate, is an operating system that knows how to talk components in your computer and acts like a translator for other programs to use it. So that's what the operating system is, right? The operating system, like example, I said, what are some of the operating systems we just talked about just now? Windows, what's the other one? Apple. Apple, what's the other one? Uh, that's your application. I just... Mac OS. Linux. Android. Mac OS, Android. Yep. Those are, yeah, those are operating systems. They are the big guy that sits between you and the hardware. They sit on top. So you have the hardware. So think in layers. The hardware comes, it's useless until you put what? An operating system on top of it, right? The operating system can be Android, can be iOS, can be Windows. These are the operating system. You notice when you have WhatsApp on a Mac, on an Apple, iOS, on an Apple phone, it looks slightly different from a, a WhatsApp on an Android, right? Because they're built on top of different app, um, on, on, because of the operating system is different. So keep that in mind, I just gave you guys a hint, right? So the operating system sits on top of the hardware. It's the interpreter that allows the hardware to talk to you and some of the other applications that you're gonna put on top of it. Does that make sense? So it allows you to communicate with the computer without knowing how to speak computer language, basically, right? Windows allow users to use what's called GUI, G-U-I. You're gonna hear this word a lot, GUI, GUI, what's a GUI? A GUI stands for Graphical User Interface. Graphical User Interface means you see a picture, you click on it. Like if you want to open a folder, there's a picture look like a folder. You click on it, it opens. It's a graphical, it's a picture. So that's what, that's one of the things that make Microsoft became so powerful because they had nice graphical user interface. You don't know about a computer, you want to open a folder. You just see something that looks like a folder, you click on it, it opens a folder, right? That's a GUI. So if you hear me say GUI, 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 it stands for Graphical User Interface. Instead of, before, what were you doing? If you want the computer to do something, you have to type the command. Open this, do that. Which we're gonna be learning later in the class for Linux. Linux is what's called a command line. You tell the computer, you type what you want it to do, it does it. But you have to learn that language. And people who are not in computers, like, ah, this is too much work. But when Windows came out, is graphical user interface. Even if you don't know how to type commands, you can just click with the mouse, things open, it's user friendly. That's the major difference between a GUI and a command line. Command line, you type the commands, graphical user interface uses pictures, okay? So Windows allows you to use graphical user interface instead of command lines. So without an operating system, a computer is basically useless, okay? So Windows and Androids, Windows and Androids are both systems that we know communicate with. These are both operating systems, right? It allows you to communicate with the computer without knowing how to speak. They both do the same thing, but one is closed source, the other one is open source. 
So now we have the operating system installed. So first we had the hardware. Now we've installed the operating system, which means now we have a translator that can talk between, allow us to talk between us and the computer. Can I still use the computer? Is it still useful now? Nope. And a computer only become useful when you what? You start installing applications on it. So think about your phone. You put iOS. When you get your phone, what do you usually do? You go to the Apple store or you go to the Android store, right? Play store. And what do you do? You start downloading what? Apps. Apps is shortcut for application, right? Yeah. So you want to go to Facebook. What do you do? You download the Facebook apps. The application now makes the computer become useful because you can now do things with it. But the application has to be built for the operating system. It sits on top of the operating system. Make sense? Yeah. Operating system is a translator between you and the hard drive. And also the translator between the hard drive and the application you're gonna build on top of it. See what I'm saying? So your computer only now becomes useful once you start installing applications on it. Does that make sense? So think about it. So you guys can be using it, but that's how it is. The apps, the operating system goes first, then you get the app, apps. It's only when you start getting the applications do you start using the full power of your computer, okay? So an application for desktop or laptop computers are sometimes called desktop application, while those for mobile devices are called mobile apps but they all is just shortcut for application. So when they talk about mobile apps, it's for the mobile devices. What are the mobile devices? Phones, tablets, yep. The laptop is like a desktop. Those are desktop applications, right? So these are the kind of things you, that are, have the mobile apps. And uh, does that make sense? You have to understand how these things work, okay? So the desktop applications, fall into several categories, right? You have some that are called full featured, right? These are like Microsoft Word. Why is Microsoft Word full featured? Because it can do complex things, it can do more than one thing. You can type, you can do spell check, you can add pictures, it's full featured. Then you have some stuff like calendar or clock, which are very basic, right? It just tells you the time. It doesn't do more than just tell you the time and the, the date, right? Yeah. So, but Microsoft Word is very robust. You can add in pictures, you can type, you can, it's, so those are more what's called full featured applications, right? And other apps like clock, calendar, these are more like um, apps that can only do one or two things. So just know that even in the application world, they, are, they, they do several things that are not all are the same, right? Some are more robust than the others. So, word processor. Word processor allows you to do what? You can write, you can do flyers, you can design and do other documents. These are more complex applications, right? And obviously the most well-known one is uh, Microsoft Word. And for those of you that are learning, this is what it looks like, right? When you open Microsoft Word, it kind of gives you like a, you know, you can type, you can do things, you can spell check, you can color it, you can insert all of these things, right? Another one is a web browser. What does a web browser do? It allows you to do what? Sorry. It allows you web to go to the internet. Without a web browser, you cannot go to the internet. That's what it does. So you have to kind of distinguish what the things are that are on your computer, right? So that's what I want. Like today you start playing with your phone, start thinking, okay, is this a simple app? What, what it has a function. The web browser allows you to go to the worldwide internet, right? Yeah. So, you know, web browser is a tool that's used for the internet. Most computers come with a web browser that are pre-installed because they know more than likely if you have a computer, you're gonna go to the internet. So it's already pre-installed, which means it's part of, they installed it already as part of the operating system. When you go and get Microsoft Word, Microsoft Office, Windows Office, uh, Microsoft Windows, it comes with, Internet Explorer. But if you want Microsoft Word, guess what? You gotta go and buy that. That's a separate one, right? Microsoft Word, Microsoft Office is different from Microsoft Windows. Windows is the operating system you go buy. 
Now, if you want to type, you want to do Excel, you want to do PowerPoint, mm -hmm. you now got to go buy Microsoft Office. That's, those are applications. The one is an operating system, the other one is an application. Does that make sense? And Microsoft Word and of Microsoft Office also sells their version for Mac as well, right? You can buy them for Mac because those are applications. It's built different. It's built for Mac, but it's still, they own it. It's a proprietary stuff. So you can go buy the version for Mac. Okay, so browsers are like, for example, some of the browser, Internet Explorer, who owns Internet Explorer? What company? Microsoft. Mozilla. That's Firefox, right? And Firefox, Mozilla. That's, and which one is closed source? Which one is open source? From these two, which one is open source? Which one is closed source? Firefox is open source. Microsoft. Internet Explorer is closed source. Close. Google Chrome. Close. Close. Who owns Google Chrome? Yeah. Kind of tells you in the, in the name, right? Google owns Google Chrome. Chrome. Safari. Who owns Safari? Uh, Apple, iOS, right? So, uh, and um, so these are some of the, the Chrome apps. And for a lot of you that have Chromebooks, you want to take advantage of these tools. Because Chromebooks is like, you know what Chromebook is? It's an Android on a, on a laptop. Yeah. That's basically all it is. It's your, it's your apps. And that's why the, the processors, the memory, they're not that much on a Chromebook. That's why they're inexpensive. Because it's made to you to just browse and use the net. It's not made to like full computer like the ones we use. Mm -hmm. So when you buy, be cautious. If you just want to browse the net, just want to play, great. For kids, that's a... But if you want to do robust work, Chromebooks are not going to cut it. But the good thing is you can get some of these tools that work like Microsoft. Like if you want to do PowerPoint, Google Slides is a pretty good tool that can use to be to create PowerPoint presentation. And you can download it as PowerPoint. It's pretty cool. If you want to write, Google Docs works like Microsoft Word, where you can write papers. And if you want to do Excel, so these tools that Google, these are all products that are owned by Google. They work pretty well with your Chromebook. So just register. If you have a Gmail account, you can have access to all of these things and just play with it. Yeah, so it, it's, it's browsing. It doesn't, because you cannot install like open system on it. So it's just made for browsing for the most part. So web browser, this is what Safari looks like, right? Firefox. Okay, now this is just basic to shut down your computer. Do not get in the habit of just pushing the power button. That's like last resort. I know some people where they work, as soon as they're ready to go, turn off, they just push the power button. That is like your computer crashing. The way you want to shut down your computer is you want to go, there's a start button. See here? On the key, on Windows 10, a little bit different, and then you click on it, it's going to say shut down. That's where you click. This is what's called a clean shutdown. It's going to shut off all the programs, then shut itself down the right way. If you just push the power button, your computer will crash. You're going to lose some documents. That's not how a good habit of shutting down your computer. OK, so that is it for my presentation. We still got about 20 or so minutes. I wanted to take questions and then maybe do a a demo, a few demos for some of the things, some of the, the, the things you can do on your computer. But any questions so far? What we talked about? Okay, no questions. So I'm gonna put a quiz, it's a short quiz. I'm gonna post on the portal after class today, and I want people to test it, to take it to see what they can remember from what we talked about. It's gonna test your knowledge a bit, you know? I, uh, so I'll be posting that after the class. Um, take time to, uh, to practice, go through the slides. The slides are right here. You can see it's exactly like I have it. So here, you can just go step by step, click here. You can make it big. So scroll down, number, you see number three. 
see that oh number three those numbers um so you can make it full screen and i have this little even if you want try to teach it to someone one of the best way you learn something try to be instructor call somebody who may be in and then try to teach them this hey let me come tell you about a computer what it is and then be the instructor you can even use a little mouse here to kind of you know walk around and show so it's a pretty cool tool and then just push escape when you want to come out of full screen and you're right there um so and again in each class you will see here what are the main things i want you to take away from these are the main takeaways you should be having okay um any questions I have a question. Hi, Mohammed. Sure. My question is, I know we're talking mostly about computers and laptops and like desktops, but how do these compare to like systems that are like in your cars and that type of thing? Like a lot of these smart um, features that are in the cars, are they all similar? Sorry. Yeah, yeah so exactly, they're all similar. Because why? Think about your car, right? Your dashboard. In your car, there's a small computer. In fact, some of the cars now have several computers. Sometimes some cars have computers for the transmission that tells the transmission when to shift and when not to shift. Remember in old days, you have the manual cars where you, you like the gearbox, you like fighting with it and you shift and gear. But now guess what? You have a computer that can that's getting input, right? When you drive it, as you're going fast, the computer is getting input. The input is the speed you're going, right? Mm -hmm. And then once you reach a certain speed, it knows I need to shift to a higher gear. Mm -hmm. That's the processing and then output, right? Mm -hmm. So there are computers all around. Your dashboard, right? How do you know when that thing comes on saying, hey, your tire is flat? There are sensors that are on the tire. When those sensors go bad, it's going to send what? Input to the computer saying, hey, this guy is down. The computer now is going to send an output on your dashboard you see that, hey, have a flat tire. Yeah. Or your engine is acting up. What's that? The engine, all of these things in your car are sending input to the computer in the car. And when something is not right, the computer now is going to process, it's processing that input constantly as you're driving. And as soon as something goes wrong, it's going to display what? On your dashboard, say, check engine, right? Then your mechanic comes, stick the little thing and say, OK, this is what the check engine light is and lie to you some more so they can charge you even more and then try to fix whatever it is. I'm joking, mechanics. The, 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 car, uh, the car CPU, I mean, uh, the central, yeah, the CPU it's a, is actually the brain box. That's a brain box. Again, the definition doesn't change. It takes input, processes that input, spits out an output, and then it's, and then, you know, so it continues. And then you can store it if you want to store it or the display is good enough, it's keep displaying it. When you have a check engine light, it's displaying until it's fixed. When it's fixed, the input continues to go and say, okay, the problem that was there is fixed. So especially with now, the cars are all computer. So even you guys, like the people that are mechanics, the real mechanics now are those electricians, those people that can understand how computers work. Because before, the people that were making money in engineering are the guys who can break apart the engine. But this car is becoming so much smart cars and those of us that are in Africa, the electricians, they do a lot of damage. If they don't know what they're doing, they'll mess your car up because they will cut the one cord or whatever. So you have to know computers. I don't care what field you're in. You have to have some understanding of how computers work for you to, to, to be able to, to, uh, to be good at what you do. So yeah, if you think about that information, input, process, output, store. Yeah, so computer, yeah, those, those cars are highly... Uh, um, made with computers. Now you have a lot of self-driving cars and that's the future. So you have some of these self-driving cars, the features that are in them is what they put in, in the new cars where the cars can brake for themselves. Like if you're backing up and then some kid comes in the back, the car would step on the brake because he knows you're going to hit that kid. So these are technologies that are in the self-driving cars. The problem with the self-driving cars are, the, why, the reason why they have to test them is they don't think like we do. What do I mean? And this is what they have to learn. So they have to be in the road a long, longer. Because a self-driving car sees something. Let's say the car doesn't have brakes. Okay, this is a good example why self-driving cars right now are kind of, they have to go through testing. They have to learn machine learning before they can become mainstream. So let's say this is you. This is your car. I'm a, yeah, I'm a great drawer. So it's a truck. 
right? And here is a kid walking. And here is a car, another car parked, right? This car is out of brakes. The car knows it's out of brakes. It's a self-driving car, right? And this, so the car knows it's going to crash no matter what. But it has to decide, do I hit this person or do I hit this car? As a human being, what do you think you're going to do? You see a person coming here, you see a car. What are you going to do? You're going to swerve, hit the car, right? But the, the computer sometimes, they don't distinguish between this and this. They have to assess. These are the quick judgment that your brain makes that the smart driving cars have to learn those decisions. And this can be a lot of lawsuits. This can be a lot of problems. So the cars have to be run a lot of time for them to learn the different patterns that we make. What's the difference between somebody not paying attention and swerving in your lane or somebody who's actually lost control of the car? You can see and kind of figure it out quick. That's why the human brain is so powerful because we can make quick, intuitive decisions that computers, computers are what? A computer is just a program, a bunch of if then. If this happened, then do this. If this happened, then do this. You have to tell computers what to do. You have to program them. But the human brain, we have that instinct, that intuition that kind of lets us make also our decisions. So this is what's making smart cars, drivable cars taking longer. The technology is there. It's things like this. Do I hit the person, that lady walking with a kid, or do I go hit the side rail? These are some of the things, but they're all computers. It's computers, it's computers, it's computers. Good question. Any other questions? Please mute yourself. Somebody's on the phone. So that being said, uh, if we don't have questions, let me, the few minutes we have left, let me kind of walk you guys through some uh, so an aspect, uh, let me share my screen. So again, uh, one of the things I employ you to do is what I call YouTube university, go to YouTube, watch videos on, on how computer works, try to get yourself, um, I'm, I'm learning. And as always, don't forget, uh, I'm a tech training, um, subscribe to this channel. And then uh, I'm, we're going to be adding videos in there, share with, with people, and also provide input. You know, you can text the admin. Uh, I know on the WhatsApp group, we kind of prevent people from posting things there because people used to abuse it. They would just post all type of random things in there. So we just restrict it because it's an educational pl uh, platform. But you can text the admin of things you have questions or, or, or stuff you want to do because we want to keep educate and want to keep sharing and making sure people are comfortable with, with uh, this stuff. And we may introduce some, some courses. I think um, maybe early next year, what we'll do is we'll do a course on how to learn, how to memorize stuff and some of these other things. So please, please um, make use of that platform to, to subscribe. Now, a um, few things I want to go over is on your computer. Now that we're talking about computer, it's, it's safety. Um, this is your computer. The first thing you want to do is you want to usually be doing updates because what happens is people always viruses and new viruses that are coming out every day. Now, Microsoft has done a pretty good job with Windows Defender before you have to go buy other software, but they've done a pretty good job with Windows Defender. So what you do is you want to come and on this search key here, you want to type Defender or you want to type updates, U-P-D-A-T. And you see this little thing that says checks for updates. Try to run this regularly. And this is a good way for your computer not to have viruses. So, and you can come here and then just run check for update. You see how it says here check for update? Just run that and it will check to see if there's any updates for viruses that Windows has put. And, and, and if there's a new uh, update there, it will update your computer. So once a week, maybe try to just run that and Windows Defender because new viruses are coming out every day. And as Microsoft sees these things coming, they will update the Windows Defender for your computer to be safe. That's number one. So you can see here, I have some security updates that are available. So you, it would update that and then you see, I can just say download and install. So now it's gonna download those updates and, 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 and install. So it has what's called the security updates. And then it also now, it finished that. 
And you see now, sometimes they have features updates. So this is Windows 10 version 2004. This is a major update where it can install it. So it says here, whenever I restart my computer the next time, it's gonna, it's gonna put this, it just so happens that I decide to run it, but you guys see why the importance of that. It's gonna give you a better version of the Windows program now because I'm running that. So this is one of the tricks I want you to, to do often. Just say updates and then run your updates, okay? Um, another thing is, uh, is to shut down your computer, get in the habit of doing this. Come on the start button, hit the power, and then shut it down from here. Don't do the hard shut off, okay? So that's another thing you wanna, you, you, you wanna work on. So um, um, for those of you that have Google Chrome or Google, you see here, when you come to google.com, so if you go to google.com, you can see here this little icon. You click on this icon, this tells you most of the products that Google offers. And Google has a lot of things you can learn from. So you see here, they, and if you go to show more, scroll all the way down and say more from Google, when you click on it, it's gonna give you the whole catalog of some of the things that Google has, right? Stuff for their phone, stuff for, um, uh, um, stuff they're working on. But what I want you to do is, let me go back to, let me just go back to uh, uh, Google for a second. You can see here, I just wanna give you a quick rundown of some of the things that are here. This is a typical Google search where you can search for things. Google Maps, these are all where you can check maps. They, they keep improving this. Obviously, you guys know YouTube and the Android Play Store. Guess who owns it? Google, because it's Android. And I told you guys today, who owns Android? Google. And then obviously, Gmail. OneDrive, this is a good cloud storage. They'll give you some storage to save your stuff on the cloud. If you don't trust your computer, you think your computer is about to die sometimes, use Google Drive. You can save files in there, you can store information in there that you can retrieve from any other computer as long as you log in with your credentials, your Google account credentials. So this is a pretty good tool. Google Calendar, for those of you that forget things, you can set it up on your phone. So anytime you have an event, you have an appointment, just set it on Google Calendar and tell you, remind me 30 minutes before my appointment or on the time, you can use that. Google Translate, pretty good deal that helps you to do translation. Photo, I can tell you that you can upload back up some of your important pictures. You can back them up here. Uh, news, if you want to know the news that are going on, you can put a, you can actually set up your reminders. It can search for you. Every time a news comes for about a, a, partic a particular topic you want, it can send you those, those news rooms. So, right? And Google Meet, this is like a video chatting. Um, and these are all free tools, right? You got Duo, Google Shop. This is for obviously shopping. Finance, if you're in the stock market, you wanna see what's going on, you can use that. Google Docs, if you don't have Microsoft Word on your computer, use Google Docs. If you send it to somebody that has Microsoft, it will open on Microsoft. And if somebody sends you something on Microsoft, you can actually open it with Google Docs. So make, make use of that. No, so for example, you wanna use Google Docs, I'm gonna click on it, right? And then it's gonna, it's gonna open like right here. And you see here, and all of this is being done in the cloud. You're not doing it like locally, right? So right here, um, it gives you this template. Let's say I wanna open a particular file. Just go to Google Docs. And you see here, in Google Docs, what do you have? Sheets, Sheets is for Excel. If you don't have Excel, you can open Excel files here. Slides, if you wanna make presentation, you don't have PowerPoint, you can create your presentation. In fact, the presentations I'm running here, they're on Google Docs. Right? So Google Forms, these are like, if you want to create like forms for students, forms for people to fill out, you can do. So it basically gives you free option instead of going and buying Microsoft, right. you don't have it. Okay. And I know a lot of students from here are joining from Africa. Sometimes um, they, they can't afford to go buy those software. This is a free tool. As long as you can upload them, work from there. And when you're done, you can save it. So if I want to add a, let's say I want to open a document here, I can just go at this plus sign. Right, it, it, it will give me a blank page. And on this blank page, I can type my paper, everything I want, right? But let's say you wanna open a file that's on your computer. 
you can actually go to file and say open and you have an option to open it from your, my drive from your computer or even from outlook or from other software so this is my computer so i can just say uh i can browse actually my see it, it, it can filter for different things so i can you see the slide these are all my slides that are on google drive so i'm actually pulling them these are all my documents on the google drive that i actually so i work with this a lot i save my stuff there i have microsoft word but i'll save my stuff in there because sometimes i'm somewhere where i'm maybe using somebody else's computer or another computer somewhere i just want to download and do my work and then save it again and you can do all this in the cloud and you can see here upload when you say upload you can actually select a file from your computer so let's say i want to pick a file from my computer see how it's it's going to open up so let's say i want to open uh this monthly weekly goal you see this is a microsoft word right but if i open it you see how it's uploading it to google drive i can work on it here and then actually save it so you don't need to purchase uh, microsoft yep yeah. you see that mm. you see that it opens it and you can save it and when you want to save it it says here let's say you want to you did some work on google drive you want to download it so when I download it, you see, it gives you the option. You can save it as Microsoft Word doc. It gives you all this different, you can save it as PDF. Oh. It gives you all these formats you can use. Very powerful tool that are free, you know? And right here, if I, let's say you make a document that you don't want to, you don't want somebody to edit. You can just say, save it as a PDF, save it as a plain text. All of this, it can be downloaded and saved. And you can do the same thing for Excel, okay? So, but wait, when you send it to someone else, and from here, yeah, you can even send it to, so from here you can say what? Email it. And you can email it as an attachment to somebody directly from uh, here. The person that open it from, is the person you... The person can, if the person has Microsoft Word, it will open on Microsoft Word. If the person has Google Drive, it can open in Google Drive. Mm -hmm. So as much as Chromebooks uh, can be, a, uh, if you have a cheap way, you can use your Chromebooks to do all of these things by just knowing what these tools are. And this is what we, we're trying to see here. There are a lot of tools out there that Google offers you, you can use to do your work. And, and a lot of things, so you're not limited. Make sense? Yeah. Any questions? So play around with it. That's how, that's the only way you're gonna learn. So again, to play with it, just go to Google, and then just click here, and all these things are here. And then another good one is Google Books. You can get a lot of free books you can read to learn that Google puts for free. So Google Books here, you can buy some. Some of them are for free. And classroom, for those that are teaching people, if you want to teach or you want to create your classroom, Google Classroom allows you to do stuff like this. You want to teach a course, you want to help students, you can have your own semi-classroom using Google Classroom, okay? Uh, Google Earth, you already know what that is, that's like a globe. So these are all, play with it, Google Arts, if you're into art, Google Ad, Podcast. So there's so many things here you can play around with to get things done on your own. So, so today, since we're learning about software, I wanted you guys to have an idea of what these things are and play with it and use it. So I think that's my time. Um, we have four minutes. If you have guys, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know in the next few minutes, or if not, then we'll call it a day. And uh, we will follow up on um, Thursday with networking. Master this stuff before the next class. Understand how the computers work because next, we're gonna do networking, how computers communicate, how this computer that's here can go to google.com, how this computer here can go to the internet. Some of these things is what we're gonna talk about next. But remember, we're doing building blocks. You have to understand today. So next week, I mean, Thursday, when we start talking about networking, you're not struggling to understand how a computer works. Any questions? All right. If you don't have questions, uh, I will see you guys on Thursday. I will post this video uh, probably early in the morning. Uh, and um, but if you log into our portal, um, you will see um, you will see that uh, we have other stuff here. And I'm gonna post the quiz as soon as class ends. I'm gonna post the quiz, and then feel free to take the quiz, and you can take it as many times as you want. Uh, so okay, you, sir. Yeah. Quick question. I I signed. I actually registered for the training 
last night and said that that uh, I will send you a, a confirmation so that I can go in ahead and complete the registration. But uh, I waited. Okay, so um, I if you did it last night, I've already conf like they. Um, I said it early in class. I guess um, that was before you logged in. Um, if you if you sign in and you don't get the confirmation, I actually went and confirmed it on my end. So if you did it last night, you should be able to log in. If oh, you are okay. not able to log in, just send me a text and then uh, uh, send me a private text and I'll, I'll look into it. But if you did it last night, you try logging in, you should be able to log in. For oh, the people no, who sorry. just logged in now, who just did it before class starts, I will confirm it in the next hour. Um, and you should be able to log in. Thank okay? Appreciate it. Welcome. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, folks. Well, thank you very much. I hope this was informative. Um, like always, um, I implore you to, 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 to use it so you don't lose it. Okay? All right. I'll see you guys on Thursday. Have a good night. Thank you. Mm -hmm.